His mother pulls her head up long enough to look him in the eye. She puts her hands on both sides of his face and tries to cover his ears. Outside, the gunfire slows. It ceases and then returns in short bursts, mirroring, Luca thinks, the sporadic and wild rhythm of his heart. In between the racket, Luca can still hear the radio, a woman's voice announcing, La mejor 100.1 FM Acapulco, followed by Banda MS singing about how happy they are to be in love. Someone shoots the radio, and then there's laughter, men's voices. Two or three, Luca can't tell. Hard bootsteps on Abuela's patio. Is he here? One of the voices is just outside the window. Here. What about the kid? Mira, there's a boy here. This him? Luca's cousin, Adrian. He's wearing cleats and his Hernandez jersey. Adrian can juggle a balón de fútbol on his knees 47 times without dropping it. I don't know. Looks the right age. Take a picture. Hey, chicken, another voice says. Man, this looks good. You want some chicken? Luca's head is beneath his mommy's chin, her body knotted tightly around him. Forget the chicken, pendejo. Check the house. Luca's mommy rocks in her squatting position, pushing Luca even harder into the tiled wall. She squeezes against him, and together they hear the squeak and bang of the back door. Footsteps in the kitchen. The intermittent rattle of bullets in the house. Mommy turns her head and notices, vivid against the tile floor, the lone spot of Luca's blood, illuminated by the slant of light from the window. Luca feels her breath snag in her chest. The house is quiet now. The hallway that ends at the door of this bathroom is carpeted. Mommy tugs her shirt sleeve over her hand, and Luca watches in horror as she leans away from him toward the telltale splatter of blood. She runs her sleeve over it, leaving behind only a faint smear and then pitches back to him just as the man in the hallway uses the butt of his AK-47 to nudge the door the rest of the way open. There must be three of them, because Luca can still hear two voices in the yard. On the other side of the shower wall, the third man unsips his pants and empties his bladder into Abuela's toilet. Luca does not breathe. Mommy does not breathe. Their eyes are closed their bodies motionless. Even their adrenaline is suspended within the calcified will of their stillness. The man hiccups, flushes, washes his hands. He dries them on Abuela's good yellow towel, the one she puts out only for parties. They don't move after the man leaves, even after they hear the squeak and bang once more of the kitchen door. They stay there, fixed in their tight knot of arms and legs and knees and chins and clenched eyelids and locked fingers, even after they hear the man join his compatriots outside, after they hear him announce that the house is clear and he's going to eat some chicken now because there's no excuse for letting good barbecue go to waste, not when there are children starving in Africa. The man is still close enough outside the window that Luca can hear the moist, rubbery, smacking sounds his mouth makes with the chicken. Luca concentrates on breathing, in and out, without sound. He tells himself that this is just a bad dream, a terrible dream, but one he's had many times before. He always awakens, heart pounding, and finds himself flooded with relief. It was just a dream. Because these are the modern boogeymen of urban Mexico. Because even parents who take care not to discuss the violence in front of them, to change the radio station when there's news of another shooting, to conceal the worst of their own fears, cannot prevent their children from talking to other children. On the swings, at the football field, in the boys' bathroom at school, the gruesome stories gather and swell. These kids, rich...